Nexus PMG welcomes you to the Bigger Than Us podcast, which we as energy geeks lovingly refer to as the BTU. Bigger Than Us is a podcast that focuses on ideas that will shape the future of our planet and ultimately our existence. We will occasionally lean into energy topics because after all, it's the key to our collective survival, but we'll also explore other ideas and topics that we believe will have an impact that is bigger than us. And now, on to today's show. Hello and welcome to the Bigger Than Us podcast. I'm your host, Raj Daniels, and today I'd like to welcome Zeka Len to the show. Zeka Len is the general partner of Responsibly Ventures, based in California, backing U.S. pre-seed startups in both social and sustainable tech, using multiple U.N. Sustainable Development Goals, also known as SDGs, as a guidepost per investment. Over the past 15 years, he has worked as an environmental economist, data scientist, nonprofit board member, and co founder. He grew up in an off the grid Japanese style home on a remote island in the Pacific Northwest. Through his world travels and living in Scandinavia during his early 20s, he discovered a deep love for people, planet, and diverse cultures. Zeka, how are you doing today? Oh my gosh, I'm doing really well, Raj. I really appreciate you having me. Zeka, thank you for joining. Zeka, just for the sake of the audience, where are you located today? Well, um, I'm on a bit of a workcation from Belgium, in fact. I, I come over here quite often. My family is from here. Part of my family is from here, and I love being over here. It's wonderful. I appreciate you sharing that, and I'm hoping you're staying safe from all the flooding and rains. <laughs> Trying to, for sure. It's mostly sunny. It's beautiful. A little bit windy out here. The windmills are turning, and just took a long walk through one of the local villages and just nearby a village. It was just beautiful. Flowers blooming. It's wonderful to be here right now. Sounds lovely. So Zeka, I want to start with what might sound like a strange place to start, but I'm just curious. What does an environmental economist do? <laughs> That's a great question. It's funny that you'd ask that. I got that question a lot when I graduated with a degree, a blended degree <laughs> in environmental economics. And I worked as a, I worked as an environmental economist some 15 years ago in the renewable energy and alternative energy space. And I would tell people often, I'm an environmental economist, and they immediately the brain started melting down. <laughs> because <laughs> some people think, well, at that time, at least people thought, well, how does the environment and the economy go together? There's a mismatch. Mm -hmm. But actually, I found through that experience that... Um, it's a very um, useful tool for making sophisticated policies or interacting with the public to, to analyze renewable energy projects and, and take into account um, the multipliers associated with key stakeholders. And that was really part of the work that I did as an environmental economist way back when. So I'm guessing way back when it wasn't a very popular class or major to take. What moved you no. to major in environmental economist or as an environmental economist? Great question. I will say that it was an accident. I was thinking I wanted to study environmental journalism. I had a passion for investing and sustainability, but I didn't quite add it up that, um, that getting more toward to business and finance and economics was the sensible approach. I thought in the long term, I want to put my money toward sustainability and things like this, but I want to do my work as a writer and a, an environmental journalist. And in fact, <laughs> this is pretty funny. I had to take microeconomics as, an, as a requirement in this program to get into the environmental journalism school, which was at the state school um, at Western Washington University up in the state of Washington. They had the environmental school of Huxley, which has a pretty rich history as a very robust environmental science and environmental um, studies um, uh, college at this state school, and to do so, I had to take this environmental econ economic or this environmental microeconomics course. Well, it turned out that I was way in over my head, and I didn't really have a lot of passion for the topic. It was quite confusing to me because I didn't have a strong background in mathematics and calculus and things like this. One day I'm sitting in class. I've told this before. I love I love telling this and I don't want to break into politics, but I will say that I was sitting in class and I read this chart of the top 10 policies that economists agreed with. 
And at the top was this one called the negative income tax. And the majority of economists that were polled in this textbook said that by a large margin showed that this was the most sensible policy to enact in the macroeconomic sense. And, I, and it said next to it, Milton Friedman. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I know nothing about what that means. And I know nothing about who this person is. So I went to the professor and I said, just curious, you know, this really stood out to me as one of the strongest policy measures that most economists agree on, 85% or something like that. And he says, oh my gosh, you have to check out the work of Milton Friedman. And so I spent a couple months learning about this negative income tax, which is now known very broadly and somewhat related as the universal basic income. We'll meet Milton Friedman and his wife, um, Rose Friedman, I believe is her name, back in the 1950s, 1960s, developed this concept of the negative income tax, which is effectively, it's effectively a tax credit for people in the lowest income brackets to stabilize the economy and lead uh, toward uh, more more consumption, which feeds back in the, into the economy, but it also creates a bit of a, a social safety net when when replacing things like social security and other uh, subsidy mechanisms uh, in an ideal world. And so it led me into this pursuit of what is economics. And, and um, from there, I decided to switch majors into environmental economics. And you get things like the study of negative externalities, um, inefficient markets, monopolies, uh, energy economics, natural resource economics, and other, other types of fields that tie into policymaking and also analyses that consultants do in environmental economics uh, in, the, in the work I was doing after college. So in your reading, have you come across a book called Small is Beautiful? I have not. I'm going to read that. It's a phenomenal book. I'm working my way through it. It's called Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher. And on the front cover, I have it on my desk right here. And it says, Economics as if people mattered. <laughs> Wonderful. Highly recommend the reading. But while we're on the topic, and I promise I'm going to get to investing, but I'm just very curious. I listened to you on another podcast that you did. And you Thank used you. a term. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, you used a term, anthropocentrism. Yes. Can you share what that is? Oh, I love it. I love that. Okay, so it's a it's a philosophical concept that um, I learned in an environmental science course from a professor who wrote this textbook on environmental science. And I wish I recalled the gentleman's name. And I know that he didn't originate the idea. It was there in the textbook at the time. And it really triggered me to think about my own frame of reference in regards to society and also the environment. And what, what it is, is it's, it's to say that um, individuals um, tend, to, tend, to associate, um, tend to associate value to things that are related to our own self-interest or related to a mirror image of, of ourselves. And take, for example, uh, the protection of endangered species. This is not my idea. These aren't my ideas. A lot of this is a little bit parroted and whatnot. I, I can't give you the references to it was a long time ago. But basically, you look at things like seal pups that look very human like babies uh, at times tend to get more attention in the media and people tend to fund nonprofits that protect dolphins or seal pups or other things that look like cute human babies. But there is an overlooked aspect in the, in the environmental protection area for things like, I don't know, tarantulas or cockroaches or endangered crickets um, that also serve a, a basic function for the ecosystem. And when you switch your mindset more to it, toward an ecological framework or a biological centric fam framework, you step outside of this realm of what is normally looked at as anthropocentricism. And you go into these other spheres that are uh, biocentricism. So we show, okay, look, we, we understand the ecosystem service aspect of, let's say, protecting uh, the sage grouse when we, we look at, um, for example, uh, windmill uh, developments, uh, wanting to protect the habitat of that. And then from one step further, you look in terms of uh, larger picture things like, for example, um, ice ages or uh, eco e ecological um, risk that, that is in the form of uh, mitigation projects that are over a longer period of time. 
and that would be more ecocentricism. So you have these different spheres. I have borrowed on that idea myself to look at uh, impact spheres, and uh, in large part it pays homage to that. Um, looking at communities, individuals, um, groups, then um, systems and other things like that. I, I put a lot of that on, out on Twitter just for fun. I like to put people into that framework sometimes. Well, actually, that was my next question. What are impact spheres and can you expand on that? Yeah, it's effectively the same thing, but it's a little bit more highlighting the social impact aspect. So when we look at, when we look at um, let's say, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, of which I'm a big fan, um, the integrated aspect of sustainability has these 17 SDG factors, and each of them have, have a bunch of sub-goals. And take, for example, poverty alleviation or water, uh, water quality or um, land, land use, et cetera, or health. All of these things are, are integrated. And um, when I look at impact myself as an investor, as a former trained environmental economist, I look at the overlaps, these so-called nexus opportunities, and impact spheres is a way to capture that in a very simplistic form that also encompasses the social impact aspect. You know, it reminds me of that, I think, mirror about everything being interconnected. Yes, yes, indeed. And um, I just want to highlight that I think that sometimes um, in the pursuit of industry, there are times when it's easier to lean into something we know and um, complexity is sometimes some, something that, that is sort of simplified in terms of how we snap to something. But I think integrated impact is, is the direction we should be moving. Some people feel that it gets muted and it's better to focus on core aspects, let's say on climate change, for example, or on water quality or on um, diversity. These these aspects are hugely important, but I think you can have everything together. That's at least my hope, and that's the aim of my my career. Um, in fact, if I'm hearing you correctly, I think that's one of the problems, or one of the reasons that we have these some of these problems that we're experiencing right now, because there's been a lot of what I would call silo thinking and not paying attention to perhaps the externalities of some of the actions been taken over the last forty years by business. Yes, yeah, the externalities aspect. It's important to note that um, externalities can be can be mitigated and are mitigated in most circumstances through time or through uh, a combination of net negative, net positive impacts. Um, one thing I try to steer toward is really just trying to improve the net positive impacts. And I always try to tell people that impact is an incremental process in itself, and that um, to to lean into it, it takes it takes a collaboration. It takes a sort of again, not to get too <laughs> not to get too like hand wavy, but I think um, like this multi stakeholder approach is useful, especially when you have like a multidisciplinary, multicultural aspect of integration. And um, in that just, again, it just goes back to collaboration, in my opinion. I agree. And speaking of positive impact, can you give an overview of Responsibly BC and your role at the organization? Oh, oh that's, that's wonderful. Okay, so Responsibly Ventures uh, is based on the, the idea that um, we can break shit responsibly. I hope you don't mind. I swear once on your show. And it, and it plays into the idea that uh, venture capital is a very aggressive sport. And the reason that venture capital is uh, aggressive, venture capital is a high risk, high return opportunity set. And it probably will always be that way. If you think about, um, I just want to go back in time, you know, to the 1500s for, uh, when, when there were merchants that would go on um, vessels to to other countries, they would finance their um, their voyages in venturing, and there would be investors who would finance the trip, paying for food and you know materials and maintenance of these ships. But then they would share in the rewards of the spoils. You know, they would um, bring resources back um, and such. And that idea that there may be no spoils at the end of the journey was always prevalent. So you could look at that as sort of your risk element. A certain percentage of trips would never return, um, you know, a profit, so to speak. 
But when they did, they could capture it through that mechanism of, of venture. Later, you know, angel investing is similar idea was, was um, so the origins of angel investing is, is based, to my understanding, based on uh, Broadway musicals and plays. Um, I can't remember the time, but let's say 100 plus years, 100, 150 years ago. And individuals would, would be sort of sponsors to these, to the talent and to these plays and similarly would be venturing like this. Um, we've seen that same form of capitalism through, I don't know, a few hundred years at least. There's a really good book I actually highly recommend called Americana. It's kind of on the history of capitalism. It's an excellent read. It takes forever to read. It's very intense, but very good. I'm also reading another really good book right now called um, Debt, which goes into the psychology and the origins of money and credit and printing. And it's a fantastic read as well. So I want to point you to that. But anyway, Long story short, Responsibly Ventures is a pre-seed VC impact fund focused on sustainability and social good. So we have this uh, integrated aspect of what we do each deal. We want to see this sort of nexus opportunity set that can sometimes be complicated on the surface, but I think drives a tremendous amount of value in, in the long run. And what kinds of companies or technologies have you invested in? Oh, that's a really great question. I actually have an answer to this one. We just backed our first startup, and I'm so proud of the team and what they're building. It's um, it's Peep. Their name is Peep, and they're based out of the Midwest. Um, I want to give a hat tip to, to to Val and Zarin. They're just great founders, first time founders. What they're doing is they are they are stimulating micro economies um, to support small businesses in a way that um, helps connect them with people who live in the communities. Um, and I think it's going to be a tremendous success. They just got into tech stars and I think it's, it, I'm so excited about them. So I wanted to give a hat, hat tip to them. We're just raising our fund, just getting launched for that under the 506C designation in May, in fact. And so we're active raising this $10 million fund. I don't want to promote my, my pitching here, but I'm really excited about it. How are they stimulating microeconomies? Well, they're just getting started, um, and I can't give you a whole lot of de details about it, but it's it's a way to connect people who who um, who want to support local businesses in a very unique way. I can put it as far as that, and I just I just get so excited about it. There are a lot of um, organizations that have done things like this um, in the nonprofit space, and um, and you could say even companies like Yelp, to some degree, have done things like this. I would say what makes them unique is their passion for creating a social and community experience out of shared purpose in the businesses you should support locally. And I did a, quite a bit of research about why I think there's a pent-up demand for this. I put an article together, kind of why we invested in them couple of things that Gen Z really cares about this issue. They really truly want to support local businesses going out of the pandemic um, based on multiple polls. And also there's an economic driver aspect, which is really fascinating that local businesses put, I think it's 70% of the capital that, that is spent back into the local economy where only 25 or 30% gets uh, put back into a local community through um, national corporate uh, chains on the retail side. So there's um, there's a real driver there, which I think is, you know, one thing going out of the pandemic, I think the timing is great for this. But secondly, again, back to sort of the economic aspect of impact here. I think that's that's what they're really addressing. Now, I could be, you know, underestimating the power of this company, Peep, but on its surface, just the way you explained it, it doesn't quite sound like a venture deal. Well, um, so I guess the question is, what is a venture deal? So a venture deal is one that has a big market. A venture deal is one that that is um, geared toward high growth. And so for our fund, we're targeting we're targeting returns that are extraordinary. And the one thing that sets sets us apart as a as an impact fund with an indirect and direct component is that the companies that we want to invest in are ones that have a unique competitive advantage to their impact focus. And with that, it is aiming to drive higher 
than normal venture return. So I call this an impact mode. Firstly, I believe that this company can be that. Um, one will never know. Um, just to note that about 70% of pre-seed deals do fail on, on average. We're trying to target 50% failure rate, which seems like, what the, what, why would you target a failure rate? <laughs> Part of that is, I believe, that impact focus will mitigate, uh, will mitigate risk on this level. So I'm very confident about that. But again, it has to look like something that is geared toward venture capital. And in, in my opinion, it is. I can't give you the details, uh, of course, but um, you know, Techstars also is excited about them. That's a, that's a good signal. Um, but yeah, it uh, always goes back to the, the, the main aspects of venture. The total addressable market, you want that to be quite large, let's say 5 billion plus. You want there to be low competitive friction. You want there to be kind of clearer paths to exits because of the, the aspect of venture capital that, that is uh, constrained. In our case, we have a bit longer of a fund to work with, but most VC funds have, say, 10 years. We have 14 years under the hood. So um, all those things are very important. Uh, and, and I appreciate you bringing it up because it's, it's something I think about in every single deal I review. You know, it's interesting you said impact as a differentiator. I've recently been speaking with the local chamber here. They're planning to have a sustainability event here in October. And I wrote an article about a month or two ago regarding ESG debt. And one of the things oh, that came up. Interesting. So so conceptually, so I, I think if I my research serves me right, I think you have a background in data science. Is that correct? Yes. I was a data scientist. So so then you'll understand when I when I explain this. I had my own tech startup and you know over time you accrue technical debt. Technical debt. To, Very familiar with this one for sure. Right. Which eventually you have to go back in and refactor, recode as the platform grows, as you have more users, etc. I've never had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the exception <laughs> you're right there's only one <laughs> and um you know there's the other kind of debt which is organizational debt which what that means is you know when you're first starting at your company you hire everyone you can you just need to get things going and then eventually you go back in and you perhaps realign the organization and you know start implementing uh, hierarchies and management and reporting systems and hopefully sooner rather than later <laughs> absolutely and you know this is something that startups obviously go through and the my hypothesis is that companies that are starting out today or are young should start looking at their supply chains, their vendors, their assets through an ESG lens in order to not accrue ESG debt. And what I mean by that is that, you know, five years from now, as there's issues around uh, stranded assets or insurance companies not insuring, lenders not lending, perhaps you know unfair practices in supply chain. I think these custom these these companies are going to be highlighted going forward, and they can use, as you said, impact or perhaps ESG as a competitive advantage and as a differentiator. Yeah, I don't use the term ESG um, for for the types of companies that we invest in. I, I look, I frame it slightly different. I say uh, this SDG overlap or this nexus overlap across multiple core ESG-like factors is is important because it, I agree with you in terms of this ESG debt aspect. I framed it similarly in saying that when early on you're looking at companies that have taken into consideration uh, more com- say, a more complex set of factors, um, diversity, training, equity, inc- inclusion, um, social impact, uh, you know, stakeholder, like uh, key stakeholder uh, engagement, or uh, governance components that, that are critical to keeping the business honest and, you know, as impartial as possible. These, these classical ESG aspects, I've, I've said it this way in, in, you know, the way I frame it, given that we're very early, um, there's very little there's very little incentive to spend a lot of time investing in things, especially in venture. I'll say, especially in venture, there's very little incentive early on to spend a tremendous amount of time overthinking and overdoing the process of of uh, stakeholder analyses and you know, theories of change and and reporting to you know B Corp status plus plus plus. Uh, in my opinion, it's very unimportant to focus on those things early on 
but rather to have a mindset that's geared toward an understanding of those complexities and then leveling up as you go, perhaps, if it's strategic, if it's strategic on a competitive basis, but also on a revenue growth basis that venture requires. So if, for example, we'll take just the example, I use this example quite frequently because I think it speaks well to this issue. Uh, You take a uh, benefit corporation status, um, could be strategic in some situations, especially for companies that are less sensitive about the venture capital constraints. However, there are takeaways from that process that, that help companies to sort of stay on us, so to speak, to reduce this ESG potential risk. But if it's if it steers away from, from the, the competitive aspect and the scale aspect and ultimately the revenue aspect, which is needed to pass through the later rounds and get to our high venture return possibility or probability, then I, I tend to tell founders like, don't concern yourself with ESG risk or everything else. Rather, yes, you're already serving these aspects of multi-impact and you have that mindset. You just really want to steer toward product market fit, traction, things like that. That's kind of the general feedback I give, which isn't necessarily to be taken as strong advice. It's mostly loose advice. Um, But yes, I totally appreciate what you're saying. Um, In terms of when they do get to scale, you don't want this company that just wants to tack on everything good after they've been doing everything poorly. And that's exactly the business I'm in, I have to say. And I I think it's wonderful you brought that to the light. Thank you so much. So, you know, what's your why? What, What drove you to turn to becoming an impact investor and then ultimately opening your own fund? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think my why primarily is driven around my experience in in living in foreign countries, in traveling extensively, in growing up in a, a very um, ecologically sensitive place. I, I sort of got the inclination very early on in my life that that I wanted to do something good f- for society, good for good for um, ecology, and um, and that has just been my driver through my whole career and my whole, pretty much my whole life. And I have probably have to say I have to blame my parents for that. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're both you- very, um, yeah, they're both very um, kind, loving, wonderful. My father passed, but they've always educated me to be quite open about the need for <laughs> good science and and also just the care- caring for people and planet. Where did you grow up? I actually grew up on a small island up in the northwest. Um, my my family was from there, and um, my my father was a bit of an inventor, architect person. That that um, we actually grew up in this off the grid home in the middle of the forest of all places, solar powered, DC powered, and I, I love telling this story. It's always quite quite fun. Just being very um, being being very aware of the environment was always an important uh, lesson growing up. And I have to, again, I have to thank my parents for that. Well, it sounds like the apple didn't fall too far from the tree. It did not. It's impossible to be candid. It's, <laughs> it's funny when, when uh, you get an early lesson, I believe it's, it's, um, it's so important. So being an impact investor last, if my math serves me right, looking at LinkedIn here, four or five years, and now with your own fund, what are some of the most valuable lessons you've learned about yourself on your journey? Well, um, firstly, I want to say that I've been focused on on impact and sustainable investing for at least 15, 20 years. I haven't held myself out as such until more recently, um, last few years as an angel investor. I have to say one thing I have learned in the last few years in particular is how important it is to stay open to the learnings that founders can teach. Uh, myself being very candid have never raised venture capital in scaling a tech startup. So I'm very hesitant of being someone to give direct advice or very strong advice. Um, I'm usually very, I kind of mitigate it through lots of measures. And the one thing I've learned is that that's actually a strength because oftentimes in VC, there's this narrative to say that those who have not been in the trenches as founders have a particular weakness 
And there is there's some truth to that, but there's also an additional strength that goes into someone that is willing to be open and help and stay committed to the the needs of the founders. That's one thing for me that's really personal. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur. I grew up seeing all those struggles, and I and I deeply have I have deep compassion for what founders go through or what I perceive them to be going through. And I think that one thing about being an angel investor or a VC investor, or someone that's dealing with startup founders that are going through a lot of ups and downs is, is remaining open and trying to ask questions that are helpful, but also inquisitive and non-judgmental. And I think that was a big unlock for me personally, that that's actually a strength. How do you remain not non-judgmental? Um, good question. I don't think there's a clear recipe for that. I think that um, if you, for me personally, it goes back to trying to maintain a sense of compassion and care for individuals and looking at my own biases and constantly keeping those in check. Because one thing I think is constant is that people have biases, myself included. We all have biases. But when I'm in a position where I'm there to support, it's my duty to have more attention on what could be my biases. Because look, I mean, frankly, my opinions can push people to make life decisions and that can negatively impact them and or possibly positively impact them. But I take the precautionary principle. I, I say, if I think something would negatively impact someone, I try to check my biases right there. That's it's the precautionary principle aspect, I'd say. It's very interesting. And I just can't imagine how complicated that would become, especially if you have a substantial investment riding on the line. Yeah. Conflicts of interests are very important. I mean, we could go on for a whole show about this. If you want to wrap <laughs> about this, I'd love to actually. I think it's important. I, I agree. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, one thing I steal from the CFA's book of ethics, which has helped me tremendously. In that curriculum around this charter financial analyst program, it's exceptional. You treat information as both non-material or material and public and non-public. And you partition information using that system under the way that those, those people are trained. I've, again, borrowed on that system. And one way you can look at it is, is acting as though if there's an aspect that is, let's say, material and non-public, then the precautionary principle is one where you would um, assert that your interest is to be put secondarily. So, okay, to put it into kind of like um, the way I understand it, um, if, there's a, if there's a situation where I think I'm conflicted, I'll, sell, I'll say to the founder, look, I'm not sure if I'm conflicted and I can't tell you why I think I am, but let's just make you aware that I think I am. So maybe you want to filter yourself. And when that happens, it gives us the opportunity to make the choice. You know, they can discuss things and, and it goes down to their level of trust and my reputation and things like that. I, I can tell you on a daily basis, I probably have a few of these where there's some type of conflict. And I just... I just don't engage in things that are, are shortcuts for my long-term success and their long-term success. And I think that's the, that's the key part of like ethical business, which I think is very important to be able to like keep your sort of uh, person in check. And there's, there's actually another interesting thing I like to use often in this, in this um, discussion that I also gleaned from the CFA ethics book. It's called the, the fraud triangle. Are you aware of that? I'm not. Okay. The fraud triangle is the inner, it's the overlap between opportunity, threat, and rationalization. And the basis of fraud or let's say unethical business is usually where there's a conflict internally for an individual where you see an opportunity and it's a potential for you to grab an edge and you're thinking in short term, let's, I mean, I could use, I use like the example of being someone that works at a bank. Okay. So you work at a bank. Um, the opportunity is that you're surrounded by money everywhere, you know, uh, like, Hey, might as well steal the money of the bank. <laughs> uh, the, the threat is that you, let's say at home, you have a sick child and you need to pay the bills and you're desperate. The rationalization 
is that, oh, all, all bankers are evil and it's only rich people who put their money at banks anyway. So I'll just steal a little bit. That's the fraud triangle. That is very interesting and something to think about a lot. The, the rationale piece is a very, very interesting piece to me. Yes. Yeah. And I'm not perfect, you know, and we're all learning as we go here. I just try to encourage just, just ethical business and it's especially venture capital. Model. It's such a relationship business. It's very important. It's a mental model. Yep, absolutely. So let's move into the future. Let's move, you know, a decade ahead. It's 2030. Where would you like to see? What's your vision for Responsibly VC? Well, I'll be very clear. I'm, I, I, I open this one I'm quite open about. Um, the vision of, of Responsibly is that positive impact is the future of venture capital. And positive impact is unique to every single company. And I want to encourage companies to find their set sets of positive impacts, plural. And I want to support them in driving toward these social, economic, and environmental positive impacts. And I, I, want, to, I want to support venture capital as a vehicle to be able to scale that. So the, I have this podcast, been doing this last couple of years, and Clubhouse Club, et cetera. And it's all centered around this this tagline, which which I ideated on and came to, which is venture scale positive impact. And they don't need to be mutually exclusive. They can be additive um, toward this better future. And for the audience, please share the name of your podcast. Uh, it's positive. It's um, the word positive, but the, the number two in the middle, eye to eye. I love that. So I've learned a lot from you already. But oh, you're so nice. No, I'm, I'm, you. you know, you give me a lot to think about. But my last question, and you've already sprinkled the conversation with quite a bit of advice, but my last question is, and it could be professional or personal, if you could share some advice or words of wisdom with the audience, what would it be? Well, I mean, it, it may seem perfectly um, you know, obvious and, and non-interesting, but I, I would just say doing the right thing is usually not that hard to really figure out if you're asking yourself the right questions. And if the right thing if the right thing is in front of you and it takes a little bit more effort, I'd say it's probably worth doing. So I always just try to encourage people to find their right thing and kind of lean into that. Um, and it's worth it. That's, that's kind of like the positive encouragement I'd like to give. Well, I think a little bit of a hat tip to uh, Spike Lee, I believe, do the right thing. Oh, oh yeah, exactly. Oh, great film, by the way. <laughs> well, that's that definitely of- a film worth rewatching. It absolutely is. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I look forward to catching up with you again soon. Looking forward to it. Thank you again, Raj. Thank you, Zeka. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review on iTunes. And you can show your support by sharing our show with a friend or reach out to us on social media where you'll find us under our Nexus PMG handle. If there's a subject or topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email btu at nexuspmg.com or contact me via our website nexuspmg.com and while you're there you can sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share what we're reading and thinking about in the clean tech green tech sectors bigger than us is a nexus pmg production